Hello, I'm Julian Allwood, and in these short films we want to talk about real climate solutions, cutting through the greenwash to find out what it really looks like. We love talking about climate change. You can see here some of the international meetings that we've had to think about how important climate change is, but while that's been going on, emissions have been rising. The graph is steadily going up, it doesn't matter how much we talk about it. It doesn't particularly look a threat when we put it like that, but actually the atmosphere is a tank. The emissions are going into the tank and staying there. And the problem is how much capacity is left in the tank. And if we show a graph of how the tank is filling up, you can see that since we started talking about it, we've used half of the remaining carrying capacity. And if we keep growing our emissions in line with the past, then we're going to have the tank full before we get to the year 2050. So the reason we have to act is that we're going to hit the unsafe limit of the climate's carrying capacity very soon. We know this graph very well. If we keep emitting, then global temperatures rise. We're already over a degree higher than the pre-industrial surface temperature, and it's going to get higher. But it's hard to relate to that description. Here are some of the many indicators of the effects of rising temperatures, whether it's increased drought, increased wind, more fires, the extreme events that are reported in the news with increasing frequency. But even those are hard to feel as a visceral threat. What I think really gets us is the fact that we're going to run out of food. This graph shows that by the end of this century, over a billion people, mainly living near the equator, are at threat of starvation if we fail to act on climate change. The reason is shown here. If we plot the amount of crop we can get out of uh, farming land in different countries, it turns out it's primarily a function of the average temperature in the country. Of course, that affects how warm the plants are and how much water they can access. As we've got better with fertilizer and farming technology, the average crop yield, these curves, rises up and that's great, that's a technological improvement. But as the temperature rises, we're moving to the right on that curve. So the crosses here show the story for Pakistan. Pakistan's crop yield has grown with better technology, but now we're at the point that increasing temperatures are causing it to fall. And over the next uh, 40 or 50 years, around the equator, over a billion people will be unable to grow or purchase enough food to be able to survive. And that's the real threat. Either they will starve, which would be an unimaginable tragedy, or they're going to migrate northwards. And it's hard to imagine how we cope with that. So that's the reason why we have to act now. Given that, you'd think we would be acting rapidly. And in the UK, we proclaim that we're making progress. I'm targeting these films primarily at developed economies where there is sufficient money to be able to act. I feel that once only we've acted in developed economies do we have the right to say what developing economies should do to follow. So here's the history of what's happened in the UK's emissions since we started talking in 1990. Our emissions from the use of buildings, from heating and cooling the air in our buildings, has hardly changed. Our emissions from agriculture have hardly changed. Our emissions from transport have hardly changed. We can give ourselves a little credit because our population has grown by about 10 to 15 percent over that period. But what matters is the absolute emissions, and you can see they're unchanged. Our industrial emissions have reduced, but we have to think about whether that's due to efficiency or just due to the fact that we've closed it and we now import more of our goods. We've done really well on waste management, capturing methane from landfill sites, and that's a big success of UK policy. And the one thing that's made a big difference is the dash for gas, the policy to move from coal to gas-fired electricity and more recently to increase our renewable generation has been a success. We've reduced the emissions from making electricity. And if you uh, add that up, you get to the report that the UK government makes to the United Nations. We've cut our emissions by over 40% since 1990. But really, we have to be a bit more honest about that. Our report doesn't include international transport, and that's growing, and it has a high impact. Uh, we also should account for the balance of trade, which was about zero in 1990, and it's got very negative since then because we import so many goods. So if we make an estimate from that, you can see that our net emissions have reduced, but have reduced much less than we've claimed. 
we're not, as a country, acting in line with the seriousness of the threat of climate change. Why doesn't it have a higher political priority? Well, it turns out that we are failing to anticipate the cost of the disaster that will occur if we fail to act. It's as if we're thinking that we could either act or not act, and that might cause a little change in our GDP, the measure of our national income, and we could opt to do it or we could opt not to do it. But that's not the case. If we don't act, GDP isn't going to have a small change. It's going to have an abrupt collapse because there will be war. We won't be able to cope with that number of people looking for food. So the cost of not acting is very much higher than is recognised in both politics and also finance at the present. Let's think about why we should act now. Obviously the threat is clear. The threat is of uncontrolled migration. There's a moral argument that we should do, but sadly, even though that's true and important, we haven't shown a history as a country of taking actions driven by morals. Here's the contrast between what each household in the UK spends on charity and what it spends on pet food. And you can see that we're consistently spending double the amount on pet food that we spend on charity. There is now a legal commitment in 73% of the world's countries have made a legal commitment to reducing emissions. And in the UK, our commitment is great. We are committed to zero emissions in 2050 and to cutting by 78% from 1990 levels to 2035. Those are biting commitments. As yet, we don't have the organisation in place to deliver on the commitment, but the target is good and many other countries are following that. We know that will lead to action. It's obvious that our self-interest is served. The security of our country depends on the international security, on protecting people in other countries so that they don't cause a global collapse, a global war, which will happen from resources. But we can also say that financially. Many companies are now proclaiming they have a, a trajectory to get to zero emissions by 2050. Here are some claims from some high emitting companies uh, made in the last year. If they deliver on them, they'll still be able to trade. But if they don't deliver on them, they won't. That means that their share price should depend on how real these plans are. And we should be getting out of companies that have no meaningful plan to function in a zero emission uh, economy. But also, I want to end by talking about this as a positive. There are threats to respond to. But there's also an opportunity here. The first people to act can grasp both a political and also a commercial opportunity. Two obvious examples are the company Vestas in Denmark, who grew to be the largest wind turbine manufacturer until they were very recently overtaken. By acting early, they created a huge business based in Denmark. And you can see with Tesla, now the world's most valuable car company, they pin their hopes on delivering electric cars compatible with a zero emissions future, and they're prospering. So in these films, we want to focus on getting to those positives, the opportunities that are waiting to be grasped on the real journey to zero emissions. In summary, the planet is going to survive, but the human race is not if we don't act on climate change. And we are looking at war and international conflict very soon if we continue to talk, but not act. But this is, although it's a matter of life and death, there are opportunities here. We can act, and there are many ways that we can prosper while moving rapidly towards real zero emissions. Despite that, this topic is plastered with greenwash. We have to cut through that. So in the next film, we'll think about how we can cut through the greenwash to come up with a real understanding of what will and will not deliver zero emissions.